This has been an incredibly challenging year for emergency medicine. Between a pandemic and the change in the job market and just the daily stress in our lives, I'm feeling a lot of just anxiety and stress and people having questions about where are we going as a specialty? What is the future of emergency medicine? So I thought it would be helpful to talk a little bit about the history. How did we get here? What is the current state of emergency medicine and really where are we going? And I'd first like to say that I have no financial disclosures, but I do want to give a shout out to EMRA and to, to thank them for this amazing documentary. If you have not seen this 24-7, 365, it is free. It's about an hour. And it's really historical moments captured for many of the pioneers in our specialty to talk about emergency medicine and what it was like in those early days to help start our specialty. And so I've borrowed some of their um, pictures from this and um, with their permission, and I'm very excited to help give a plug for their documentary. So how did medicine start? So it's, it's hard to think, but back in the 1700s, um, there were, you know, essentially the doctors with a little black bag that would go to people's houses. And if you had money, the surgeon would come to your house. He would literally take out your appendix in your bed and really go home. There was no hospital. There was no operating room, but this was really only accessible to people that had money to pay for a doctor to come to their house. If you were really destitute, if you were poor, there was no national healthcare system. There was no way to have access to care. Until really the mid 1700s, when Charity Hospital opened up in New Orleans and shortly after that Bellevue Hospital, which provided free medical care. It was generally run by the nuns and some of the churches. And these were for all intents and purposes, um, sort of homeless institutes to provide basic shelter, food, many of them were rampant with infection and they provided basic medical care. But it was the only infrastructure we had to provide healthcare across the United States at that time. At the turn of the century, we saw this huge change. We went from less than 200 hospitals to almost 4,500 in a matter of years. And that happened for a couple of reasons. One, we had an influx of funding from the government. And two, we were a nation on the move. We were building you know, different highways. People were moving further away from their family unit and their, their GP who used to come to their house. And so healthcare became more centralized where people would come to the hospitals now to seek acute unscheduled care. Technology was also changing, right? It didn't fit so neatly in a little black bag anymore. These first CT scanners that had two or three cuts, but that people could get their diagnostic imaging somewhere inside the hospital itself. So people came to the hospitals, but we weren't ready for them yet. The early emergency rooms, and they were rooms at the time, were often in the basement with leaky, unexposed pipes. It was called the pit, and that's really where our nickname of pit docs came from. The early ERs were not even really rooms. They were a series of stretchers. There was really little or any privacy. Uh, you had all comers who would come in the front door. There was no EMS or paramedic system. The first ambulances were actually Cadillacs. Uh, they were hearse drivers that would kind of fight over the dead patients because those were the ones that they actually got paid for. And people would have to ring a bell to actually get service and see if they were able to take care of their patients. The early emergency rooms were staffed by medical students and by interns. So people with the least amount of clinical experience were taking care of the highest acuity patients with no supervision really whatsoever. And so the early pioneers of the specialty thought, gosh, we need to do something better than this. We have a unique skill set. And what if we could just focus on just the emergency room patients and not have to worry about our clinics or our kind of other quote unquote day jobs? We need someone who has the skills to be able to take care of anything from infants to geriatric patients and to know how to acutely stabilize a uncompensated patient who is really in distress. How do we get the training to do that? What if we created our own specialty? But people thought they were crazy. We were not welcomed. People had turf battles. This was about money. It was about getting into their business and they didn't want us there. We were perceived as the enemy amongst multiple other specialties. And the first time that emergency medicine went to ABMS, the American Board of Medical Specialties, and asked that emergency medicine be added into the House of Medicine, they didn't even take us seriously. We lost and we lost badly. That vote was 100 to 2 against emergency medicine becoming a recognized specialty. So we had to go back to the drawing board. The reasons we got criticized were that we didn't have any research. We didn't have a unique body of knowledge in their mind. 
what could we as emergency physicians contribute to medicine? How would we help patients? And so we had to go back. We had to think about how could we develop our own skill set? How could we develop the value and promote what it is that we bring to the house of medicine? And it was really those early people, Peter Rosen, who we lost a couple of years ago, and Judy Tentinelli, who argued, we can do this better. We do have a unique body of knowledge. We do bring value and can help provide excellent care to patients in the emergency department. By the way, I work with Dr. Titanelli. She was my chair when I was a resident. And I can tell you there's nothing more intimidating than having Dr. T chase you around the emergency department being like, did you read my chapter? Sometimes I hadn't quite read the chapter yet and I had to own up to her that yeah, I would do better next time. But finally in 1979, we became the 23rd recognized specialty in the House of Medicine. Since then, a lot has changed, and legislation and policy has largely shaped what emergency medicine is and what it will be. One of the most important pieces of legislation was in 1986, was EMTALA. And this is the law, of course, we're all familiar with, that says that you can't wallet biopsy. We can't just dump the poor patients who don't have insurance simply on their inability to pay. The definition of emergency medicine, very frankly, is that we take care of anyone, anywhere, anytime. And we're incredibly proud to do that. But this came with an unfunded mandate. And if you take one slide home from my talk, this is probably the most important to really understand the challenges that emergency medicine face and how this is going to impact our future. Now, obviously every emergency department is a little bit different with respect to who their payer mixes are. But if you could take a global look at all patients who come to the emergency department across the United States today, Approximately one third of patients have private insurance. So this is things like Blue Cross Blue Shield or Aetna. About a third of patients have Medicaid. Now Medicaid is paid at the state level, but it reimburses very poorly. It may reimburse 10 cents on the dollar in many places, far below the cost of care. And the remaining one third is self-pay, which for all intents and purposes is no pay. Medicare, which pays better, but is still often less than the cost of care and things like workers' comp. So approximately two thirds of patients do not pay the cost of care. I'm gonna give you an oversimplified analogy, but what if you owned a McDonald's franchise, right? And someone told you, you have to feed people. They are hungry. You have to give them free hamburgers. We're not gonna tell you how to do that. We're not gonna pay for it. You just have to sort it out. Well, you'd have to charge really expensive milkshakes, right? To help offset the cost of all those free hamburgers. And that is effectively how our healthcare system has functioned over the last several decades. And this is how the safety net is funded. It essentially is cost shifting of those who have private insurance to help pay for all of those who don't. And the problem is that private insurance market is continuously getting smaller. We have continuous cuts to reimbursement, which threatens the viability of that safety care net. And every single person, whether it is a corporate group, whether it is an academic group, whether it is a nonprofit, for-profit hospital, everyone is trying to target that private insurance market because it is the only way to keep your doors open. And this is coming some of the challenges as we move forward in the business of what is becoming healthcare and emergency medicine in the United States. We've also changed how we got reimbursed. So historically, we used to get paid on how complex a patient was, how many tests did you order? Well, then the government realized, well, that doesn't really make sense because then we're just paying people to do more tests and that just incentivizes people to order more CAT scans and more labs. It translates to higher costs, but it may not necessarily make better outcomes. So how do we incentivize physicians and healthcare providers to do things based on outcomes? So they created MACRA a number of years ago and MACRA pays for value. So now the government wants to know how they can give you money that will translate to better patient outcomes. Well, how do you measure value? It's really effectively quality divided by cost, right? But quality is, is hard. There's so much in the emergency department about quality and patient outcomes that are beyond our control, right? Sometimes patients just have bad genetics. Sometimes they were in the wrong place at the wrong time. Sometimes it has to do with social determinants of health. Maybe they can't afford their medications. Maybe they have addiction issues. Maybe they can't get a primary care doctor. All of those things are going to ultimately impact quality. But at the end of the day, this is the game of how companies, hospitals, doctors are reimbursed is providing equal or better quality at a lower cost. And so in an effort to sort of meet this game and to meet these metrics, 
Hospitals, healthcare systems, academic medical skill centers are having more and more mergers and acquisitions to try and reach those economies of scale to achieve same quality, but at lower cost. And so over the course of the past two decades, we have seen across the entire healthcare market, just a huge surge in the number of mergers and acquisitions. So hospitals are now health systems. Insurance companies, there used to be dozens of them. Now for all intents and purposes, there's really only three or four. And you can see in several different states and different markets, the largest insurer may have 70 or 80% of market share, where it essentially becomes a monopoly. For the first time in 2018, employees or sorry, physicians are more likely to become employees than own their own practice. So you can be directly employed by a hospital, by an academic medical center, for a physician staffing group, but we're less and less likely to own our own practice. And that grew for a number of reasons. That was partially because some doctors didn't want to deal with the business. They just wanted to do their shifts and take care of patients and didn't want to deal with all the aftermath of running a business. The second thing is because of government regulations, it became harder and harder to run a business. The amount of infrastructure moving to online records of quality reporting has become incredibly burdensome and challenging for small groups to keep up with all of the regulations and to be compliant. And because of this, and because of the fueling of consolidation, more and more groups have consolidated into bigger and bigger groups. Which leads to the question, is bigger better? And I think this is an existential kind of question within our specialty right now, as things are consolidating across all of healthcare, what does this mean? As we become bigger and bigger groups, we have more administrators. There's more third-party people who are not physicians who are now involved in patient care. This is also potentially contributing to higher costs across healthcare in the United States. So how do we handle this? Well, essentially, this is an ongoing tug of war between the insurance companies and the physicians over how do we fight over what is fair payment? How do we get paid for that very small sliver of one third of patients who have private insurance? Well, as we talked about in many markets, there's only one or two insurers. They have a basic monopoly. And when you have 80% of the market share, you can pretty much name your own price. So in some sense, there are some pros of having larger physician groups to help have that same leverage, to be able to pull back and demand fair in-network rates. And so some people will say that's part of the pros of having that negotiating power, that leverage to work with insurers. The cons are, of course, as we consolidate and have larger and larger groups, you may or may not have physicians in the power position of ownership of making medical decisions. And as the growth in corporate medicine and private equity has impacted the growth of medicine, it potentially interrupts the autonomy of our practice and it potentially affects quality and cost, but we don't know yet what the impact of those different ownership models and financing models have on quality, on cost. It's important to look at though that this is changing and private equity is in all aspects of healthcare. Private equity is investing in hospitals. They are investing in medical equipment. They are investing in physician staffing groups because it is profitable. Many people don't like to talk about this, but I think it's important that we understand that healthcare is a business. It is one of the leading sectors in the American economy right now. It is a $2.3 trillion industry. And as long as healthcare is profitable, Corporate groups, private equity groups are going to continue to invest in healthcare and medical practices, the impact of which we are still learning to understand how this will affect our practice. Um, my point here was that private equity is invested in all aspects of healthcare. Um, I think there's a lot of confusion that people seem to think that private equity and corporate management groups are the same thing. And certainly there is private equity investment and even ownership in many corporate management groups. But it's important to understand that private equity invests also in academic hospital centers. And in fact, some of the largest private equity investments are in things like Kaiser and Mayo Clinic and Cleveland Clinic. Um, so there is, is opportunities where private equity can be a good thing to help invest in, in research and physician practices and patient care, but the ultimate impact on our practice, our autonomy, the cost of care, and the quality of care has not really been answered. But people have concerns that medical costs are soaring. And part of that is that people are living longer, right? It's not unusual to see people in their 80s, 90s, 100s coming to the emergency department. Um, and they have more chronic illnesses, more complex diseases. These are people who can't be seen in a five minute outpatient visit. They are referred to the emergency department because of their underlying medical conditions and complexity. 
And that's good for us because it helps drive demand. And we do think the number of ED visits are going to continue to increase because both the population increasing and the graying of America. But the problem is that the supply is tamping up faster than the demand is. ASAP and others have been doing workforce studies every seven to 10 years over the last several decades. And what you see is over time, the number of hospital EDs have actually decreased. This is because of many closures in rural hospitals and, and even some suburban and urban hospitals. But the number of residencies has increased precipitously. In 2002, we only had 144 residencies. Today, we have over 250. The one constant theme has been that rural emergency departments lack emergency physicians. And our emphasis has moved from board certification to gender to the role of physician extenders. So where were we in 2020? Well, Chris Bennett says that if you include residents and people who are not clinically active, meaning people who are primarily teaching research, we have close to 70,000 emergency physicians. Of those, about 48,000 are clinically active. Our median age is about 50 years old, and we are about 28% women. So this is sort of plateauing or even decreasing over the past couple of years as far as to our gender diversity. But a shocking positive emergency physicians practice in rural areas. Almost 95% of us work in urban or suburban areas. Yet one in five Americans live in rural America. And these patients deserve high quality emergency care as well. So how do we bridge that gap and really help with that supply demand mismatch where right now we have a huge distribution problem? We're also seeing a change in the workforce. So now about 25% of visits in the emergency department are seen by PAs and nurse practitioners. About half of those are seen independently and half are seen in conjunction with an emergency physician. But this is certainly changing our workforce and the job availability as well of emergency physicians. So this is something ASAP took a hard look at and in 2018 realized we need to take a look at how quickly the supply is growing, what is the demand and where are we gonna see gaps for the future so we can start doing some planning now and help shape those market forces. And as part of that, we surveyed all of the graduates of 2019 and we asked them from emergency medicine residencies, how hard was it for you to find a job? Did you find a job you were happy with? And to somewhat many people's surprises, over 80% said they were able to find a job and many of them found their first or second choice per the survey. So it would seem to indicate that although we're slowly growing toward saturation at some point in the future, we weren't there in 2019. But then in 2020, COVID hit. And across the country, volumes went down by 40%. And this severely impacted groups' ability to continue to hire doctors. People had to cut hours, people had to cut spots, and people had to retract the contracts that they had offered new graduating residents to be able to impact the drop in ED volumes across the country. But I do think there is light at the end of the tunnel. We're starting to finally get through this pandemic. As of last week, we're not back to baseline yet, but we're back to almost 85 to 90% of our volumes across the country. So it's important to understand that the job market right now is impacted by really two things. One is the more long-term, slowly growing supply relative to demand that we still need to work on. But the second, really, the reason we're feeling such a tight job market right now is because of COVID and the contraction of the job market with decreased volumes. So as this short-term market force is correct, we anticipate there will be more jobs in the job market. And again, there's gonna be that distribution problem of where those jobs are concentrated. But I do have hope because I think back to how far we have come as a specialty, right? 50 years ago, they told us emergency medicine would never exist, that we would never become a specialty. And yet somehow we made the impossible possible. We made the invisible visible. They could have never imagined that if they could fast forward 50 years into the future, emergency physicians would be on every single news outlet across the country. We'd be in the White House advising the United States president on how to deliver healthcare and how to handle a pandemic. We'd be CEOs and CMOs of hospitals of health systems. Of knowing how far we came in the last 50 years, it's almost hard to imagine what we could be in the next 50 years and what emergency medicine will look like. So what are we doing to address sort of the supply demand mismatch in the future? Well, one, we're understanding that practicing emergency medicine in the future is likely gonna look a little bit different than how we practice now. Different healthcare delivery models, rural hospitals, telemedicine, we have to teach our residents new skills that weren't as important 20 years ago, but are gonna be a core part of our practice going forward. 
So every 10 years, we review sort of the ACGME requirements of how do we best maintain quality? How do we prepare our residents for the future? And how do we raise the bar for those standards to ensure we have the most properly trained workforce going forward? And so we'll be working with multiple other EM organizations to critically analyze what the requirements are to become an accredited residency and how we raise the bar on those standards. We're looking at scope of practice. So 30 states right now are battling legislative issues with scope of practice. ASAP has always believed in physician-led teams and the importance and value of everyone who works in the emergency department. But non-physician providers do not and will not replace board-certified residency-trained emergency medicine physicians. And this is a core part of our practice that we have trained and spent over 10,000 hours to prepare for exactly this. When a patient is decompensating, how do you pick out that needle in a haystack of who's sick? You need that experience, you need that training, and this is something we will strongly advocate for on a state and national level. And we need to think bigger of where is emergency medicine outside of the hospital brick and mortar emergency departments, where else can emergency medicine go? So during the pandemic, companies like Avera had over 150 critical access hospitals where you could work from a mega center, you could work from your living room and provide board certified residency trained emergency medicine advice through telemedicine to help improve patient care. We're looking at new payment models. Right now, it doesn't make sense for us to pay for emergency medicine based on volume. I think one thing we've learned from this is that healthcare is historically recession proof, but we're definitely not pandemic proof as evidenced by the drop in volume across the country. Other public health services like the police department, the fire department, public utilities have a mechanism that has government funding to pay for preparedness, regardless of whether or not those services are utilized or not. Perhaps we need to rethink the way emergency medicine is financed to provide that healthcare safety net to be able to have that preparedness anywhere, anytime, any place. CMS is now looking at rural hospitals and looking at how do we redefine these hospitals that can't afford to stay open. Maybe we just make it an emergency department and call it a rural emergency hospital. And that's going to be implemented in 2023. But in the meantime, this is just down the street from me in San Antonio. We already have different models of healthcare systems. 85% of patients across emergency departments are discharged. 85%. So we don't necessarily need more hospitals, more inpatient facilities. What we need are more emergency departments, emergency hospitals, rapid disposition and diagnostic centers to help triage who needs to be transferred to an inpatient center and who can be rapidly worked up as an outpatient. There's other models that have been proposed of hybrid models that combine urgent care with emergency departments that really say that we are the champions, we are the experts that cross the full spectrum of acute unscheduled care. And how might the delivery of this change and look different in the future to have more price transparency, but allow us to really evaluate patients across the whole spectrum of acute uncompensated care. So I encourage everyone here to really be an advocate. And what is advocacy? It's really changing what is to what should and what can be for emergency medicine. So I want you to think of what drives you crazy on shift. Is it the opioid epidemic? Is it scope of practice? Is it boarding? Is it violence in the ED? Find something that drives you crazy about your shift, about your job, and find a way to make it better. That is one of the most professionally rewarding and satisfying things that I do as an advocate for emergency medicine, and I encourage you guys to get involved. Some of the advocacy issues we're tackling right now, surprise billing, which is taking the patient out of the middle and trying to come to a fair reimbursement independent dispute resolution process between insurance companies and physician staffing groups and physicians. We're looking at the opioid epidemic and how do we reduce some of the barriers in prescribing buprenorphine and medication assisted therapy and making it easier for us to get help for our patients who have addiction issues. We're looking at mental health and after losing one of our own Dr. Laura Breen this year, introducing legislation that would destigmatize depression, mental health, and encourage physicians and others to seek help and get resources to help cope with many of the stress and wellness issues that we as a specialty are facing. And we're looking at health disparities. Why is it that one person who lives eight miles down the street has a 10 times higher mortality because of COVID? We need to look at the social determinants of health that impact our patients' outcomes and mortality. So there's a lot going on right now with emergency medicine. We have some challenges and I'm not going to sugarcoat things that everything is going to be easy. We're gonna have some growing pains, but we are going to get through this. And I know this because we have gotten through an incredible amount this past year. And to me, COVID has emphasized that what we do has purpose. 
what we do is important and impactful. And what we do not only influences and save lives, it transforms the entire healthcare system. And for that, we should be incredibly proud. So thank you for all of your service. Thank you for your incredible strength and bravery throughout this past 18 months. I look forward to working with you. I apologize for the technical glitches and I look forward to working with you guys in the future.